Today, I want to talk to you about Jesus' resurrection. He is alive and well. He is saving people today. And I want to tell you that I am, listen, I can't express how excited I am. I've spent a lot of time this week getting prepared for today. Now listen, this is kind of hot if you want to cut me back a little. It's, it's, it's an amazing day to be in the house, Lord. Now listen, I ain't got a problem being loud because I'm excited. And when I'm excited, I speak fast. And so hang on because we're going to be going through much of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now listen, last week we uh, looked into Jesus. He was going into Jerusalem. We began the Passion Week in your connect groups. And uh, we, we talked about Jesus coming down off the Mount of Olives. And he came through. They were laying down their jackets. They were laying down their cloaks. They were laying down their palm branches because they thought some military leader was going to come up in there and redeem Israel in the sense of freedom from the Roman oppression. But they were wrong. Jesus came in to redeem them from the oppression of sin, which had held man for ever, ever since Adam and Eve. Ever since Adam and Eve. And it was the fall of man that, that brought about Jesus coming and dying on the cross. So today, we're, we're walking past the cross. Jesus is not on the cross today. He's not in the tomb today. He is alive and well today. Just as you and I are walking here, Jesus is alive, sitting at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning. He's putting all things underneath His feet, as we're going to talk about here in just a moment. Now listen, normally we'd ask you to stand in honor and reverence of, of the reading of God's Word, but listen, you're just going to have to sit still and hold tight, because I'm going to walk through verses 1 through 28 today. 1 through 28. I heard the gasp out there. Just hold on. We're going to be good, all right? Listen. Timothy Keller writes this about the resurrection. It's the hinge upon which the story of the world pivots. Listen, there's many a martyr who's died for a cause, but there's only one who's rose from the grave, and that's Jesus Christ. He is risen and He is alive. And I want to tell you today that He is... He has given us a good news. He's given us a gospel. And Paul has written to us. He's written back to the church at Corinth. And he tells them, look, we know you got some issues, okay? We all have issues, right? And there's times when we need the Lord to speak to us. <laughs> somebody said amen. Somebody looked across like, maybe you got issues. I don't know about me. But, but we've all got issues. Paul writes back to the church of Corinth. And he's telling them, listen, we need to understand the resurrection is real. Jesus Christ is real. And listen, as I speak to you today, Paul starts off right here in verses 1 and 2, and he gives us the positions of those in the presence of the gospel. He gives us the positions of those in the presence. And so there's first off, I'm standing up here presenting the gospel to you. Not just presenting, proclaiming, compelling you to believe in the gospel. Jesus says in Mark chapter 1 verse 15, He says, Behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's the good news that God the Father would send His only Son to this earth to be born of a virgin, to live a life without sin, to die in our place for our sins on the cross, rise again, and He's coming again. That's some good news, guys. Amen. If you don't believe that's good news, let me say it again. No, I'm gonna, I'm, I'll say it enough during the service. Listen, I'm going to keep repeating this because it is good news. And Paul writes there in verse 1, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, the good news, which I preach to you. The first position within the gospel is that of preaching the gospel. I am going to preach the gospel. You and I preach the gospel. It doesn't mean that you're going to have one, two, three, four, five major points that you're going to point out to people all the time, but you're going to understand that you've got a testimony and you've been changed by the power of Jesus. You're not changed by the, by the tone or the inflection of my voice. You're not changed by a man who stands in this pulpit. You're not changed by a person that teaches in a connect group. You're changed by the power of Jesus. The Bible tells us in Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. All through the Old Testament, they're constantly trying their best to, to, uh, to satisfy the wrath of God that is to come upon sin by, by sacrificing doves and, and goats and bulls, all these different things, but they were just a temporary setting because Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. He had to be fully God and fully man. People say he's 100% God, 100% man. That means he's 200%. And sure enough, he, he, he is well beyond any of our scale. 
well beyond any of our scale. And his death on the cross, it had to be Jesus. It had to be perfect, sinless blood. It had to be the blood of the Lamb. The Bible tells us that he emptied himself. And it says, by taking on. We talked about this on Wednesday nights with the students. Listen, Jesus didn't remove anything. He added humanity to who he is. So he's 100% God and 100% man. So he's 200%. Listen, he didn't empty himself saying he is not God. If he was not God for one nanosecond, he would not be God. He died in our place for our sins. That's what he did. And listen, I'm, I'm just getting started. That's pretty much introduction. So there's positions with the gospel. Today I'm preaching the gospel to you. And I want to tell you today that there is nothing more important to this world than hearing the gospel. But boy, we'll tell them about Alabama. We'll tell them about every other sporting event. We'll tell them about Auburn if, if you have to. You'll, you'll tell them about all these different other things. And, and, but listen, I want to tell you this. We need to be talking about Jesus. Preaching, like I said, does not mean that you've got to have all these points. You ain't got to have all these pages. What you need to have is a testimony and a changed life, and you've got something to preach. So there's a preaching position. Paul even writes about this to the church at Rome, where he writes in chapter 10, verses 14 through 18. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Preacher. Okay? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. Listen, it don't matter about your physical feet. It's about your spiritual feet, okay? So just get out there and share the gospel, whether you got big old gigantic finger toes like I got or whatever. Just go preach the gospel. Go preach the gospel. But listen, Paul writes, but they've not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed, their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the end of the world. We have got to go to the ends of the world preaching the gospel. And that's the position I stand today. Preaching the gospel. You are in the receiving position. Look at, look at what it says there next. Which you also receive. You, know, you think about a quarterback and a wide receiver. The quarterback goes back, he's got the football. The wide receiver runs a slant or whatever, an in route. And he throws it to him, he receives the ball. You're there receiving it today. And I hope today that if you have not received the gospel of Jesus Christ, that today you will do that. Today you will submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, give Him your life, and allow Him to guide you and love you and walk you through this life. It's a difficult life. There's a lot to come along the way. There's a lot to come along the way. John 1, 12-13 says this about receiving. But as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in His name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of man, but of God. Listen, salvation is not, a, is not something that's passed down through the genes of your mom and daddy. Salvation is not passed down that way. Salvation is passed down from God the Father, through God the Son, to the Holy Spirit, back to Jesus, back to the Father. Okay, that's the way it comes, and that's the way it goes back. It comes to you by Him. Salvation is a personal issue. It is, you're not going to be saved because mom and daddy are here. You're not going to be saved because you came this one time out of the year. Listen, you're going to be saved by the power of Jesus Christ, him alone. It's the only way you're going to be saved. It's the only way. But you're here today. I'm the quarterback. I'm throwing the gospel to you. I hope you catch it. I hope you catch it today. Because once you catch it, you can stand in it. He tells the, the church of Corinth, he says, uh, which you have received and in which you stand. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Yet again, here's Paul. He says, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. 2 Corinthians 1, 24. For by faith you stand. You stand by faith because you believe that Jesus is risen from the grave. You believe that Jesus' death on the cross satisfied what was needed to, to take away the wrath of God from mankind for all of eternity. You have come to believe that. And you have confessed because you're in a saving position. He goes on to say, 
In verse 2, by which also you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. There's the saving position. The Bible tells us that if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised his son from the dead, you shall be saved. For as with the heart one believes unto the righteousness, as with the mouth one confesses unto salvation. Listen, you are saved at the moment you confess Jesus Christ as Lord. You are being saved as you walk through this life with Christ as your Lord. And one day when you breathe that final breath, you will be ultimately saved against all the sin and everything that's ever come into your life. It is a saving. It's, a, it's an immediate saving, but it's also a, there's a process to the saving as well. I want you to understand. Within the gospel, there are positions. There's preaching, there's receiving, there is standing, and there's saving. We stand in that gospel. It gives us a firm foundation on which to stand. It is, it is a great gospel. It's a wonderful gospel. It's a good gospel. Because you know why? Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. You know, the Bible talks about if you build your house on sand, it's a shifting sand. It's gonna, but if you build your house on the rock, it ain't going nowhere. And Jesus Christ is that rock upon which we stand. Now, I have spoken with our students multiple times about the gospel in the previous uh, year. And I've even mentioned it to you from the pulpit. You could say the gospel is as simple as Jesus. I think Zach said the same thing last week. The gospel can be just as simple as saying Jesus. Because he is good news. He is God's only son who was sent down from heaven to die in our place for our sins on the cross. You can say Jesus. You can go to this. This is the next one. There's one, three, five, and then like you can go. You can start at Genesis and you can go to the end of the Bible. We, we were looking at, um, I believe it was Philip a few weeks ago, talked about how he ran up to the Ethiopian eunuch. And uh, from the point in the Old Testament where the Ethiopian eunuch was reading, from that point forward, Philip explained the gospel. He explained G who Jesus was from the Old Testament up until that point. And that the, the Ethiopian unit received Christ. He said, there's some water. Should I not be baptized? He said, sure enough, let's go down there and let's get wet. And he baptized him. Listen, there's th there are things that are primary to the gospel. Look at verses 3 and 4. Paul says, for I delivered to you first of all that which I also received. See, he, he was in that position. We're all in these different positions at one time or another. He said, I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. The first thing that you need to know about the gospel that's primary to the gospel is that the death of Christ was for our sins. It was complete. The Bible says he died once for all. Now, his atonement covers everyone. But you've got to call upon the name of the Lord for that to be applied to your account. Confess him is Lord. Believe in your heart. God raises himself from the dead and you shall be saved. The blood is then applied to you. Just like the blood was applied to the doorpost there for the uh, Israelites who were in Egypt. The death angel passed over them because the blood was applied. Listen, if they did not apply the blood, the death angel came in and got their firstborn. I want to tell you today, the blood has been applied to my life. I pray it's been applied to your life so that when that time of death comes in your life, it passes over you and you can be with the Father for eternity. That's what we need to understand. The scriptures predicted this in Isaiah 53, 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And this implies that Christ was sinless. There was even a, a historian employed by the Romans. His name was Josephus, who recorded that Jesus stood as the one, the Messiah, for the Jews. He recorded that. This isn't just something where I go, well, I back this up by the Bible. And I say the Bible's true. Well, how do you know the Bible's true? Because the Bible says the Bible's true. Well, how do you say the Bible's true? Well, I believe it. I don't have to have anything else. I don't have to have anything else. But there are historical records that prove that Jesus Christ was real. Jesus Christ died. Jesus Christ rose from the grave. We're going to talk about the proof of the gospel in just a moment. But listen, when we think about the death of Christ for our sins, Christians need no longer fear punishment for their sins because he has borne the full pen penalty in our place. Jesus has. He was buried. Listen, you don't bury people who are alive. If you did, you made a grave mistake, especially for them to be there for three days. Man, that'd be pretty creepy, you know what I'm saying? Jesus was dead. 
He was, he was nailed to a cross through the most sensitive nerve system, uh, the nerve points in the whole body, through the hands and through the feet. And then, you know, the Bible tells us that uh, he, would, he was to have no bones broken. So like when he was on the cross and they needed to take him down for the Sabbath, because he couldn't be on the cross during that time, or the Passover, excuse me. They, they, took, they had to take him down to make sure he was dead. They pierced him through. They pierced his heart. And blood and water flowed. So Jesus was dead. You bury dead people. Okay? And so he says this in the text. He says, For I deliver to you first of all that which I also received. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And that he was buried. Listen, if Jesus was not dead, we would not have what Peter wrote in 1 Peter 3, 18-20. Jesus, while dead, went and preached victory to those who rejected him by rejecting the message of salvation through the ark God had nowhere to build. Jesus went. If he was not dead, uh, without Jesus being dead, we would not have been in the, he would not have been in the realm of the dead to preach to them. He was dead. He wasn't swooned. He wasn't asleep. He was dead. And he was in the grave. And he went to hell. And he told him, he said, look, I told you back in Genesis 3, the snake will bite my heel, but I will crush his head. This is the victory that was foretold. The proto evangelion is how that said. It was the first gospel that was ever preached. And Jesus accomplished that. He accomplished that. His burial... Christ's burial means his death on one's behalf was no mirage and that someone has gone to face the consequences to replace death. That's what it means. That's the second primary point of the gospel. The third one, his resurrection on the third day was according to the scriptures. He, was, he rose again the third day according to the scriptures in verse 4. Peter's speech in Jerusalem at Pentecost emphasized how the resurrection had, predicted by, had been predicted by David in Psalm 16.10. Christ's resurrection means death has been defeated. It has been stripped of its power and its sting. That's what his resurrection means. Death has no hold on me. I don't fear death. I don't want to face it early. Listen, but I ain't scared of it because I know where I'm going. I know where I'm going. Jesus said he went to prepare a place for me. If it were not so, he would have told me. He's prepared a place for me. He's prepared a place for you if you have called upon him in faith. And you've confessed him as Lord. You've repented of your sins. He's got a place for you. Mark Driscoll says the New Testament is the explanations of the implications of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The New Testament is the explanations of the implications of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Listen, you may say, I don't know if I believe this today. Now many of you come here, listen, if, if we don't believe this, we, we, we're, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. Our faith is weak. It's, it's not even real. But listen, there were firsthand accounts of people who saw Jesus after he rose from the grave. Look at verses 5 through 10. It says, And that he was seen by Cephas and then by the twelve. Who is Cephas? Peter. That's right. He was seen by Peter. Peter had done what? He had denied Jesus three times. He was in a pretty depressed place, I would imagine. The man he had given up his life for quit his fishing. In all his business, he had done all that, left his dad, left his family uh, to, to, to follow after Christ, and now he's dead. I'd be pretty down in the dumps too if I'd given up all that for some man that just died on the cross. But what did Jesus do? He appeared to Cephas. And then once Peter sees the risen Christ, he becomes bold. He preached the Sermon of Pentecost. He, he was crucified upside down. Let me tell you, you don't do stuff like that if you don't believe in it. You're not going to sacrifice things for you, things you don't believe in. Think about your time you give up for the things you believe in. You believe in your kids? Oh, you sacrifice time for them, don't you? You believe your kids can, can excel in a sport, an athletic realm? You sacrifice your times. You get off work immediately. You're going to the gym. You're going to the ball fields, whatever it may be. You're taking them there. You're sacrificing your time. You know why? Because you believe in it. You believe in Jesus? You believe in Jesus? All right. Show it to the world. I don't have to see it. it you ain't got to prove nothing to me. It's between you and Jesus. 
But I want to tell you something. What are you going to sacrifice? Peter was sacrificed upside down. The disciples, it says he saw the twelve. That's, that's a common reference. We know that Judas went out and, and after he gave the 30 pieces of silver back to the, to the Pharisees, he ran out and he, and he committed suicide. He killed himself. But they still referenced him as the twelve because that was just a common thing. So he was seen by the twelve. Listen, you don't, you don't follow after a Christ when the government's after you and the Pharisees are after you. You don't follow after that unless something has changed. Something miraculous has happened. Listen, they served the poor. They suffered. They were hated and despised. They left their normal life for a life following Jesus. Thomas even doubted. He doubted. But then yet again, he said one of the greatest statements recorded in the Bible. He says, my Lord and my God. You know, for the longest, nobody would name their kid Thomas because, you know, everybody called him Doubting Thomas. Of course, today people don't read the Bible as much, so nobody thinks about it. But if you read your Bible, you know you ain't got to call him Doubting anymore. You could call him Confirmed. He confirmed Jesus was alive. He said, I will not believe unless I see the, the nail-scarred nail hands and his pierced side. And when he saw Jesus, when he saw the resurrected Lord, he said, my Lord, he fell to his knees. He said, my Lord and my God. Listen, today, if you see the risen Savior, Savior. Only thing that should come out of your mouth is my Lord and my God. But we don't, we don't see him. We don't see him highly, highly lifted up and resurrected. We still look at him here. This that had his purpose but an empty tomb. An empty tomb confirms to us that our God lives. And because he lives, you know, as a song we say, we can face tomorrow. Listen, there's a lot of things about tomorrow we don't know. But he is risen. Surely he is risen from the grave. Listen, I am halfway through and I still got seven minutes. Listen. He, saw, he was seen by over 500 witnesses at one time. This was a very public event. Okay, this was not some, we're going to hide up in this little closet somewhere and I'm going to tell a few folks. And then y'all disperse and tell folks. 500 people at one time. We don't even have, we couldn't seat that many people in here right now. We'd have to have three services to seat 500 people. Listen, that's a lot of folks. And he goes on to say, at that he says, he, in verse 6, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. And listen, if you had any doubts, if you thought this was a falsehood or a myth, Listen, that, that can't happen because you know what? Of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep, some have passed away. But the greater part is still alive. If you've got any doubts about what I'm saying, go ask somebody. Go ask somebody. You don't believe me? Go ask church at Corinth. Go ask church at Farmstead. If you don't believe Jesus is alive, come speak to somebody who's been changed by the miraculous power of Jesus, and you'll find out he is alive. He was seen by James. How many of you would, would uh, it would take a resurrection or a miracle for you to say, my brother's the Messiah? Right, Jacob? You know, or Jonah, better yet, because he's firstborn. You know, I mean, like, my brother's the Messiah, and mamas are like, I spanked my kids growing up. I know they ain't perfect. You know? How many mamas going to worship their sons as Messiahs? Not that many. They may view them very highly. You know, I want my, you know, uh, was it James and John, their mama asked Jesus if, if they could sit on the right left hand of, of Jesus. <laughs> Uh, man, she's pretty cocky, you know? But, but uh, we understand no brother is going to say, uh, I think my brother's God, unless he saw him after he rose from the grave. James went on. He, he wrote one of the books that just about every preacher that's ever filled the pulpit's ever preached from. <laughs> if there's one book that I can say that just about every preacher that's ever filled the pulpit's preached from, it's James. And if they have it, shame on you. But you need to. I preached through James twice with the students since I've been here at Farmstead. Listen, it's, it's a great book. And James come to believe. All the apostles saw Jesus, a wider circle of believers. And then Paul, uh, he says he was born out of due time. That means he didn't see Jesus incarnate, but yet Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. Saul, his original name, uh, he, he was on his way to, to capture and persecute Christians and Jesus appeared to him on the road and he says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And, and uh, the Lord gives him some directions and, and, and Saul immediately calls him. He says, Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, if you've ever had an encounter with the resurrected Savior, just as, just as Thomas did, and just as Paul did, you're going to say, my Lord. 
That's going to be about the only appropriate response you're going to have. And then you're going to follow in obedience. If you've encountered the risen Savior. Now, listen. If Jesus didn't rise from the grave. Look at verses 12 through 19. Now, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? They're saying there's no resurrection of the dead. If there's no resurrection of the dead, Christ can't be raised, right? He can't be raised. But remember, he's, remember he's dealing with some issues there at Corinth. And so people have, have, have gotten off track. Remember, they, they received this gospel back up in verses 1 and 2. He said, you've received this gospel. How in the world? Now, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how does some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. We are of all people most hopeless if Christ has not risen from the grave. Have you ever thought about how different our world would be if Christ had not risen from the grave? How hopeless this world would be? How one-sided this world would be? It would be a terrible place. You and I, I wouldn't be standing here and, and dressed up. We wouldn't be trying to figure out where we're going to take pictures. We wouldn't be thinking about how many folks coming over to the house to eat Easter supper or dinner with us. We wouldn't be coming into this facility because this facility wouldn't exist because Jesus just died. He was just some other man. It's just some other man. Listen, the resurrection is the hinge upon which the world pivots. We put so much... One thing I've, I've said to several people, you know, people come in and they wear a cross around their neck on a necklace. Listen, that's all good. I, that's good. That's awesome. We understand what the value of the cross is. But why has no one ever marketed an empty tomb to wear on, on a necklace? That is, is most, one of the most vital things to the faith of the Christian believer. If Jesus just died on the cross but never rose from the grave, we wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be here today. I, who is this, this? three-year glorified man in Israel? Am I going to know any history about Israel if Jesus had not risen from the grave? No. I'd be like, Psh, whatever. There wouldn't be wars. I mean, it, like, you might say, oh, goodness, that's a bad thing to bring up. There wouldn't be all these different things. There wouldn't be conflict. You know why? Because Jesus said, I come to bring a sword. Because you've got to follow after me. Listen, this world would be very different if Jesus had not wrote, risen from the grave. It would be a very different world. Could you imagine how you would raise your children differently if Jesus Christ had not risen from the grave? Well, you know, there's no afterlife. There's no resurrection of the dead. There's no afterlife, so just, you know, do whatever. What would it matter about what we cared about the world, about one another? If there's no afterlife, it don't matter. How we treat one another. Listen, Jesus showed us how to treat one another. He said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said that. If Jesus didn't rise from the grave, that'd, be, that'd fall on deaf ears. There, this wouldn't be here. There might be the first half. <laughs> might be the first half. But you'd have a Jewish nation still waiting for a Messiah and none of us would be here. Because the Gentiles didn't get reached into the New Testament, guys. We, we, wouldn't, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't even be a people. We wouldn't be a, a branch grafted into the vine. None of that would happen if Jesus Christ had not risen from the grave. It's, it's so important. The scripture tells us there, I, I basically paraphrased a large portion of that. If Christ is not risen from the dead, it says there in verse 14, that our preaching is empty and your faith is also. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ. Whom he did not raise up. If, in fact, the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. We would still be in our sins. We would still be trying to figure out some temporary sacrifice if Christ did not risen from the grave. For if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. If Christ did not rise from the grave. It wouldn't have mattered today about being here. 
We wouldn't have worried about a Facebook feed. We wouldn't have worried about having instruments or singing praises. You know, what in the world? I mean, where would the joy, where would our joy be focused? I don't know. Have you ever thought about that? If there was no resurrection? But y'all look at verse, y'all look at verse 20 with me. Now, I don't know what translation you have, but I'm going to read it to you from the New King James Version. And then I want you to say it out loud with me. Okay? Verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead. Say that with me. But now Christ is risen from the dead. But now Christ is risen from the dead. So all this stuff, all the hopelessness, all the depression, the, the lack of joy is gone. We've got it all. We can have joy. We can have life. Jesus says in John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. You can't give a life that's dead. You can only give a life that is alive. And Jesus is alive. Man, how, come on. What? Jesus is alive. Come on. Listen, if that's not something to be excited about, mm, wah, you've got to get saved. You need to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You need to understand there's no way to enter into heaven except by Jesus. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man shall come to the Father except through me. That is, there is no validation of that without the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. None. He is just on a lonely path, walking his own little happy way if he had not risen from the grave, but he did. And so he is the great shepherd who we as sheep follow because he has led the way. He was the first fruits of the dead, as the scripture tells us. And I could really go into a whole lot of depth about that, but I'm going to hold off. So today I'm going to conclude right here. I'm not even going to get into 20 through 28 because that's going to be another 15 minutes. So this is, this is what I want you to grasp today. I want you to grasp this today. If there's one thing you take with you, Jesus Christ is alive. And he rose from the grave so that heaven and earth may have a perfect sacrifice because he was fully God and fully man. And he died in our place for our sins for eternity. He died once for all is what Hebrews tells us. He died once for all. And listen, and, and Paul caps off 1 Corinthians 15. He's speaking of how we will be incorruptible if we receive Christ, if we confess Christ is our Lord. He says, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our victory over death, hell, and the grave comes only through Jesus Christ. It's through his shed blood. It's through his perfect life. It's through his rising from the grave. And it's the fact that every word he has spoken has come true, and he will return again. I'm excited. I don't know if you can't tell. I pray today that you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. There is, there is no greater decision you'll ever make in your life. No greater decision. I love my wife. And listen, we've been married for 22 years. We, we dated for three years. We engaged for a year and been married for 22 years. Listen, I love my wife with all my heart, but my wife ain't going to get me into heaven. Jesus is. So my focus and my number one attention should be on Jesus. And if I'm focusing on Jesus, my love is going to be poured out onto my wife and onto my kids. It's going to be poured out onto y'all. Man, whoo! Because God demonstrated his own love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's what he did. He's demonstrated that love for us. You want to demonstrate your love for him? This is what needs to happen today. As the band comes to lead us in our time of, of decision. Listen, Ephesians 2.8 says, For it is by grace through faith that you are saved. This is not of works. This is a gift of God so that no man can boast. Today, if you've never made a confession that Jesus Christ is Lord, you can do that today. You don't have to put that off any longer. There's a classic invitation. says, the Savior is waiting. 
But he's not just waiting, he's seeking. He's like that father we studied about a few weeks ago in our connect groups. He'd go out and he would look every day, kind of waiting. But he'd go out and he would stand and he'd watch for his son to come home. But one day he saw his son way off in the distance. And the Bible says he did something that most Jewish men would never do. He ran to his son. Jesus is seeking you today. There's a reason why you're here. It's not just because it's Easter. It's not just because it's the day that Jesus rose from the grave. You, God puts you here at this, on this campus, in this sanctuary, because maybe you need to be redeemed. You need salvation. You need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ.